Okay, and welcome and good morning, everybody. Um, seeing everybody is arriving at day two of the Streetworks Conference. Extremely warm welcome to you all. Um, just while the numbers are building up on the participants, um, I just want to touch on the fact we've got two splendid um, sponsors today Atkins Utility Solutions over my right shoulder and uh, SKU on my left shoulder. Um, Good numbers building up. Um, we'll just give it another another 30 seconds or so before we get into the uh, main domestics. Um, I think we've got a really, really thoughtful and insightful uh, day for you today. Um, and um, really enjoyed yesterday. Um, uh, I got, so got some great feedback from yesterday. And just to, for any of you who are wanting to know, yes, we will be sharing the, uh, the video of, uh, of, of the session yesterday, should you want to share those more broadly around your, uh, your companies, that will be the, uh, the aim. Good. Well, look, we'll get started, I think. Today, day two, we got to said something for everybody. Um, first, we want to uh, examine um, um, with the panel, the uh, learned panel that we have with us today, and um, open our minds up to exactly what what we mean by digitalization. What are we actually talking about when we use that expression in the uh, Streetworks vision? But what does it mean to other people? And what's the importance of that to both Streetworks and, dare I see, with Kat on the, on the uh, call today, roadworks in this, uh, in this fine country? Um, later on today, after lunch, we lean into uh, our first workshop, just to remind you, on the Streetworks policy landscape. That's at 2 p.m. And then at 3 p.m., um, we lean into uh, excavated waste workshop um, at this you know, critical juncture for that. But look, um, we're, uh, we're getting up towards a full house now. So first, some domestics. I just wanted to point out, for those of you who, uh, are not, who might be new to Zoom, uh, if you look top left-hand corner, we are recording this. So um, uh, uh, if, if you don't want to be recorded, your comments recorded in any particular way, then please uh, sign off now. So far as asking questions is concerned, please do ask questions um, and ask them in the chat tote. Do not use the Q&A buttons, please. Just use the chat tote. That just allows for us for a more free and easy way for others also to see the questions that are being asked and for us to manipulate those. Just as a general point, please don't try and answer the questions in the chat tote, okay? Let the panelists answer the questions. Um, by all means, give an opinion into answering a question, but relatively try and keep the questions short, otherwise it just makes it harder uh, for us to, uh, to really address if you ask multiple questions in the same one. Um, but what I'd also say is please do use the chat tote if there are any subjects that we talk about over the course of the day that you'd rather that we... Um, that we, that we you, you'd like us to, to cover because we can insert a special if needed later on in the week. After all, responsiveness is the key. I'd also like to touch on the fact there are no JAG colleagues on this year like there would be at the Streetworks Conference last, last November. Uh, this is very much an internal audience for us to focus on, on things and, and just with our invited guests that you see uh, on the screen who I'll introduce um, in a second. As I mentioned to those of you who weren't on before, um, two sponsors supporting us today, Atkins Global and relatively new member Scube, and we'll be hearing more um, from our colleagues about those things in the next, today and the next few days. So as far as today is concerned, it's quite a long session, 90 minutes is allocated for it because this is an important area for us, but what I plan to do is break it into two and we actually have a coffee break at 10 past 10. So um, what we'll do is we'll break the first 35 to 40 minutes into a discussion about the technical aspects. And by that, I mean, you know, digitalization is here. We are shopping, we are recreating, we are transacting. You know, we're doing business online. We're speeding up the process. We're saving time, saving cost, and, and all those green recovery effects are so important to government at the moment, as we'll hear a little bit about, and no doubt from Holger shortly. But the other side of the coin of this is the overwhelming provision of the information data that's coming in and we need some good information management. There's no doubt about that. And, uh, and street management may not be the entire answer to the, to the prayer on that one. Also, we should be aware, I think in this sort of technical age, you know, that customers and the traveling, traveling public, they want instantaneous knowledge where, where roads are blocked, where the impacts are, and, and hence the success, we should argue, of Google Maps and Waze. 
you know so we need to know how we can bring to the, the roads and the underground world to the general public in their own technical approach really well but where does remote and robotics and things in in terms of the, te the technical side of things of, of, of digitalization really work no dig keyhole steel solutions and things like that this is this is not this is not a, this is not a subject of purely about that but it's obviously leans into that so that'll be the main base of the next 35 minutes and then we'll have a break and then we'll come back after the break i want to focus on some of the behavioral aspects and i'll uh, introduce that as we get to it so let me just introduce the panel uh, to you now um, certainly on my screen uh, top left he'll give you a wave uh, simon top from elgin simon very warm welcome indeed Top right on my panel, for those of you who've been a minute, and many of you who have been involved in the uh, cabinet office programs, Holger Kessler, uh, the NUAR uh, program. I've said a little bit more about that as we go. And then Kat Quain from the Scottish Government, uh, bottom left on my, on my screen there. Um, so the, the, the topics we really want to um, get into, I've sort of sketched over a little bit about how to approach that. Um, and, and, and through the lens, perhaps, of, you know, what does digitalization and streetworks really mean for them in their individual areas and studies? And, and what forms are already taking place and, and how are they already being used? And then uh, looking at this, first of all, through the, through the tech lens. So um, without, without more ado, let me turn in the, uh, in the first instance to, uh, to uh, Holger and, um, and let him... Uh, get us going with a few a few words to start with. Olga over to you. Good morning everyone um, and thanks Clive and Streetworks UK as a whole for, for having me on and um, a great uh, amongst a great um, set of panelists um, to talk about digitalization um, and I'm going to give a, a couple of minutes background to to our project and who I am and what we're doing and yeah I've, I'm already hearing very much the topics um, um, that I would like to, to, to stress today, which is really, I mean, a, a particular the word behavior, behavior and then collaboration came up in Clive's introduction already. So, yeah, my name is um, Holger Kessler. I'm a, a technical advisor to the Geospatial Commission inside the Cabinet Office. I'm a geologist um, and geographer by background. I work for the British Geological Survey and have been studying the, the subsurface in terms of its geotechnical and um, groundwater and, and soil properties for the first 20 years of my career, actually creating the, the underground um, um, model, the ground model of the UK um, for all sorts of purposes. But I was seconded to the Cabinet Office when the Geospatial Commission was established, um, which early on identified a lot of opportunities in unlocking the value of of, of location data and particular in the infrastructure and construction sector and I started out in 2018 doing landscape review, the industry review research into the, the, the feasibility of establishing a underground asset register. So I switched from studying the soil and the geotechnics um, to, to the pipes and cables and infrastructure and ducts. Um, inside the ground. Um, got in touch with many of you probably on the call and um, the academic sector and we then kicked off a pilot program called so NUAR, N-U-A-R is the acronym. I've posted a quick um, a brochure in the chat um, for, for a year, 2019 to 20 um, to earlier this year. We're now in preparation phase to um, build out um, to a regional and eventual national system. So the underground asset register um, pilot have, um, we have drawn a lot of learnings, um, in particular about stakeholder engagement, developing trust and collaborations, um, which is all about your behaviors. We did test, of course, the feasibility of the technology. So we can talk a little bit about the learnings there. Easy to use, security, safety, um, um, and in terms of national critical infrastructure, but also in the back office, a lot about, uh, as we're dealing with sometimes commercial and um, sensitive assets, the, um, the, the security issues, uh, tracking and auditing, and of course the importance of, of a, a, um, a data model and a standard and, and an interoperability. So we learned some on the technical side, but trust engagement, 
having clear use cases was very helpful for, for the, the success. So we didn't say we're going to solve everything to do with underground assets. We focused on strike avoidance and um, efficiencies surrounding the sharing of, of, um, of, of plans, um, keeping the technology simple. And yes, safety, security, um, um, working with the CPNI, Center for National Protection of National Infrastructure, the National Cybersecurity Center, um, and not doing um, the legal and security um, aspects as, a, as an add-on at the end of the project, but having people in the commercial, the legal and the security side involved right all the way through. And yeah, finally, working which sort of links to yourself, Clive, and Streetwear 2K, and the Hawk, who are not in the room today, but also to, to CAT um, and Transport Scotland, working in collaboration and not reinventing the wheel and talking to um, um, friends and colleagues from the Netherlands and Belgium, where we have existing systems, to Scotland, uh, the Vault system, and, and importantly, you and the users on the roads or streets um, to get to, to what, where we want to get to together. So that was my intro, and I look forward to the next hour and a half to go into more detail. Thanks very much, Olga. Okay, um, Simon, um, with that sort of broad swathe of stuff, any of the sort of the technical things that you'll be excited to pick up and pick out of that, but also take forward? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Thanks very much, uh, Clive, and good morning, everybody. Yeah, I, I think it's very interesting looking at where digitalization is going to take us from a streetworks perspective. I think just to touch back onto um, one of the things you uh, mentioned, Clive, the, the industry has got a lot of challenges upon it. Well, yeah, we, we have, we're doing ever more works on the roads. We've got an aging asset infrastructure to maintain we've got a need to uh yeah to take up road space maintaining those assets we've also got high levels of traffic on the road and we have an ever more demanding um and yeah a, a set of public with higher expectations um and that means that that we've got a, a far greater set of pressures upon us uh, as an industry to uh yeah to, to go and do things better and to communicate out and i think digitalization sits absolutely at the heart of that um, at the heart of that problem. I think if you wind the clock back, you know, to the beginning, you know, of Eton back in 1991, we, we have got a rich history as an industry of making, you know, digitalization didn't exist as a term then, but actually the introduction of Eton and electronic transfer of notices was taking digital information and beginning to use that in a digital process to start sharing uh, information uh, across organizations and beginning to share that information with the public. So I think we, we've got a rich history and I think it's evidenced when you go and look internationally, I'm fortunate enough to have spent quite a lot of time in Australia, in the United States. Uh, you know, the UK is 10 years ahead, at least, you know, in terms of uh, how we deal with things as a street works uh, industry and how digitalization comes into effect but but i think it is also fair to say 1991 was quite a long time ago and technology moves fast and, and i don't think the industry has necessarily moved as fast as is possible so i think it is absolutely right that we're looking at, at digitalization looking at um yeah making use of data understanding what data is critical um, so things like underground asset registers, absolutely critical in that pre-planning phase, uh, ensuring that we've got the right information to make uh, correct decisions about works uh, that are going on. But, but I also think you know, just providing that information and providing that data is the start of the process. Uh, as Holger points out there, having that available is one thing and is a great thing to achieve, but it's then about embedding that within the organisational process, getting the organisational change to adopt and to embed that is where the real value is going to be uh, unlocked. And I think the other bit um, that we need to consider, and again, you, you alluded to this a little bit at the start, Clive, um, it, it is that there's a whole raft of things to consider. And I think underground assets are incredibly important, you know, dealing with um, no strikes, uh, making sure we've got the planning process. But there, there is a whole other facet to the street works industry, which is about the traveling public and the disruption that we potentially bring and um, yeah, it's, it's not solely in that planning phase where we need to consider the engineering challenge, but it should be in that planning phase that we're considering what this means to the public, what level of disruption are we likely 
to cause to the public? How do we communicate to the public what's going to go on? How do we communicate and collaborate with the highways authority to ensure that we're getting the right plans in place? And that is exactly where digitalization sits for me, is about pulling all of this data together in a consistent digital format so that it can be shared simply and easily across organizations and aid that collaboration but also that we have these digital mechanisms to communicate out to the public. Yeah, again, as a public, we're, we have just adopted SatNav. Our, our expectations are to know what is happening immediately. Yeah, and, and so much of um, what we look at in Streetworks is around planned works, yet yeah, getting on for half of the work that goes on is not planned, it's emergency works. So we can do everything in the world we want around the planning process, but actually there's a whole digital communication piece around emergency works that we need to consider. And again, that, that is exactly at the heart of digitalization, is ensuring that we've got good digital data, that we have um, digital communication channels, something we at One Network have been trying to develop over long periods of time is around that real-time communication to ensure that when there is planned works going on, that people have an ability to communicate within real time, both between organizations when a TM crew goes out on site and closes a road or closes a lane so that the highway authority is aware of that and there is good communication from the utility and their contractor to the highway authority but also that there is a channel to communicate that out to the public through those sat nav uh, channels we've seen some great examples of collaboration uh, recently you know, with um, you know, utilities promoters uh, working with highways agencies, you know, utilizing some of our technology to deal with some of that real-time communication. But I still think there is a long way to go um, you know, in ensuring we get um, not only that yeah, having the technology exists, but having the adoption, having that organizational change to embed those sort of ideas and concepts into that day-to-day -day process to realize the true benefits that not only benefit the, the promoter in terms of organizational efficiency, but ultimately benefit the traveling public as well, ensuring yeah, we minimize disruption on them, but where we can't minimize disruption, that we at least communicate to the public and uh, give them awareness as to what is happening. Simon, thank you for that. And um, if, if, if I may, let me just quickly share, obviously, I think most participants on this call will be aware of the recently published Hawk five-year vision for street and road works. And indeed within that, the, um, the section that deals directly with digitalization in terms of the importance of what that is, and then sets out these things. But I think what you've drawn out for us very neatly is those sort of what I would call five or six areas of the the technical challenge is in terms of you got to get a register, right? You got to know where stuff is. You've then got to be able to communicate it. Um, and you've then got to communicate not just the traveling public and the road users, but also to the people who work on it, as you point out, the HAs and the LAs. There is the sort of the, the daily operational traveling public thing with SatNav. And I think you made a really interesting point there about, you know, the um, emergency works aspect being the predominant thing. And in, a, in some respects, that's the thing that really creates the congestion um, that probably could be avoided more easily. And then there's two aspects of the data you talked about. One aspect to it is, you know, the, should we say, you know, Holger's challenge, what is the accuracy of stuff underground? And then it's actually the data that's held in the formats that it's held. But I want to just press you, if I may, on one point, and that is the issue. Um, you said, you know, we've been doing this since 1991. Uh, we, we had a great lead, but we haven't really stayed out in front. So what aspects of those six I've touched on there? Or are there some particular things, Simon, that occur to you where, where you really want to draw attention that we we haven't stayed out in front. So, so I'll, I'll qualify that in saying, I, I think when you look globally, we are still in a very good position. You know, if, I, if I turn the lens on the United States briefly, um, just because I've done some work with the, um, some of the uh, State Departments of Transport and Cities and Counties there recently, you know, they, they still exist in a world of very siloed data and not wanting to share with each other and not really having uh, systems um, you know, and data formats to make that sharing possible. So I still think the UK um, and what we do as a streetworks industry is good, but I think we have to recognise, you know, 1991 was a long time ago. And, you know, if we had digital data then, why aren't we further ahead? You know, and I think that there's a number of things uh, that 
that, that come into the to the mix there you know I think coming on to data it, the, an interesting point there is I, I still think we have a tendency to think in a siloed way you know we, we engage as a business with lots of uh, works promoters and the contractors and yeah inherently this data does exist and generally in a digital format or if it's not in a digital format technology exists to digitize that data in a fairly um, you know, simple fashion but, uh, but I think the challenge is you know, if you're looking at a pre-works planning process there's a there's a huge raft of different data sets that are useful yes the underground asset register is of critical importance but there's so many other aspects that also need to come into that at the surface level yeah how what type of road are we going to disrupt is there public transport we need to consider are we near a school yeah there's a whole range of information and I think one of the critical challenges that we see working with uh, different organizations is that they've all got access to most of that data but it's probably in five or ten different places so then embedding that into a a true operational process is a challenge and we might deal with the same contractor in two different utilities organizations and it's in ten systems there and five systems there and they're different systems so then it's very difficult to marry a, a simple process uh, across the two of those so so i think that is one of the key challenges is understanding the fullness of data that is required to make good decisions and looking at how that's systemized and I think a lot of that comes down to organizational change yeah having IT infrastructure um, you know process set up um, to, to go and um, you yeah, know realize the benefits uh, of that digital data I, I think one of the other interesting uh, aspects to look at um, and this got touched on a little bit yesterday afternoon in the collaboration session um, to a degree is how do we encourage this change you know I, I think we're going to come on to that in the behavioral section Simon but great point to make and I, I really want to major on that a bit later on so sure. let's just, I'll hold my thoughts let's, until just, let's, just, <laughs> let's just hold that thought okay cool um, Kat let me come to you obviously you know you, you were uh, for a time very closely involved with the uh, what you still are in, in terms of Scottish Roadworks Commissioner's Office in, in Scotland and also you know you you've taken technically some slightly divergent paths in Scotland um, but but do you, do you have anything you wish, wish to give us by way of a sort of a contrary view in terms of because you know being nimble efficient and, and relatively small in Scotland you can move at great pace in some of these areas um, give us some thoughts on that. All right, excellent. Um, so, well, um, just to introduce myself first, um, if you don't work in Scotland, you've probably not come across me before. I don't know how the audience is split, but um, if you haven't come across me, I uh, work for Transport Scotland, which is Scottish Government's transport agency. I'm responsible for the Roadworks policy in Scotland, which basically means the legislative framework. And I also support the Scottish Roadworks Commissioner. Um, and I can explain who he is if you don't know who he is. Um, what I will say is, is that I will occasionally say we, when I say we, I will usually be meaning Scotland generally or the Scottish Government, but I will not speak to the, the Scottish Roadworks Commissioner, who is an independent post uh, supported by Transport Scotland, but entirely independent in his operation. And he's also the um, uh, legal keeper of the Scottish Roadworks Register. So there's really, there's really two things really that I can add here. Uh, one is that if, if you weren't aware, Scotland operates on a, a noticing system for roadworks. Um, and for us, roadworks is generally any works and roads. So that doesn't mean local authority works. That means all the works that we do. Um, so there are no permit schemes and we don't work on a permit basis. Uh, we do have a, a national register for planning and coordinating works, which is actually, it's existed for a long, long time. It was originally a fax machine system. Um, I can talk about a little bit about the history of that, but we have this asset register existing. Uh, and one of the latter developments of that was the introduction of what we've called VOLT which is uh, showing the above ground and below ground apparatus that's held by utility companies and roads authorities and some other odd other people, tram lines, that kind of thing, bus stops. And it's all displayed in the register in one map for the people that have got a statutory right to access it. Um, so we're slightly further down the line. Uh, Holger, right, we, we do like to like, uh, work together. We, we don't reinvent wheels. I was actually just thinking that wheels work much better in pairs. And what we've really done is supported Holger in his journey and, and coming through. Um, we're quite lucky in Scotland, as you say, Clive. We're, we're you know, it's a much smaller area geographically, a uh, much smaller road network. We have uh, 32 local authorities, which I think is the same numbers as just in London. 
And so it's much easier to get everybody around on one table. Where we, we diverged really in Scotland was, was back in 1991, which predates me. Um, so just, just for my own personal small CV, I started with Scottish Water in 2004. Uh, and then moved to a local authority in uh, 2008 or 9, and then latterly into the Scottish Government. So that's the kind of journey I've taken. Uh, so around 1991, before my time, the NARSWA came in, and it, 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 at that time there was no Scottish Parliament. So what we had was a, a piece of legislation which was in two halves. Set. So the first half applied to England and Wales, the second half applied to Scotland. In Scotland, we agreed collaboratively that it would be much better to have one single register that we all used, that we all paid for, rather than individual registers by authority area. Uh, so the path that England took was, uh, and Wales to a degree, was individual registers by authority. The path we took was a, a single national register, which is actually probably the single biggest contributing factor to some of the behaviours that we can talk in the second session. What it means is we established early on a principle of collaboration and sharing. Uh, so the Rocks community is wonderfully collaborative. I mean, it's not that we all sit around campfires saying kumbaya, but we do get on quite well. We tend to resolve disputes at local levels. There's, there's not a huge amount of escalation that goes on. But also the, the, the benefit to that and the benefit to the community is that things like Vault can be developed through a need of the community. So as much as the register itself is kept by the commissioner, and um, it, you know, I know that the DFT have made great strides recently with Street Manager, uh, which is a sort of attempt at a very similar thing, and, and that's going quite well. Um, the, the commissioner is the legal keeper of the Scottish Roadworks Register, but the idea for Vault did not come from any of the previous commissioners, nor did it come from Scottish Government. It was, it was not a top-down idea. It was the community itself that said, we already have this one system where we can talk openly, all the data is open, everyone can see what everyone else is doing, everyone can see everyone's works, you know, inspections, the lot's open and it's all there. Why can't we just use this thing that we already have for this other purpose, which is looking at underground and above-ground information in one area? Um, and the commissioner at the time, John Goody, was quite happy for the register to be developed in that way. Um, so much so that we, we had, and I think actually it is, the, the, we've looked around the world, as far as we know, it is the only system of its kind that's operational. I mean, if you go back through history, the, there's been lots of attempts at doing this kind of thing. The earliest one I found was a 1985 uh, was it Durham Records trial which uh, I think wasn't successful. I don't know why. If anyone has information on the Durham Records trial, I'd be really interested to see it. But there have been attempts previously for this. The, the way that we did it and the way that we brought it in was um, through, I mean, it was, it was also, um, there was a huge collaboration in how it was actually set up. So we have to thank uh, Leeds University because it was you know, based on their, their VISTA work and uh, the water industry were quite heavily invested in it. But what it meant was we could end up with this system that was, was much more streamlined and it really arose out of not asking CEOs, not asking very senior managers, but asking directly operational staff, what do you need? And once you capture what do you need, you can then develop it into something that actually works. The other thing, and I, I was actually going to focus on Vault, but something that Simon said really uh, triggered this for me is, um, I mean, he's absolutely right, 1991 was a long time ago. A lot of the timescales that were built into that original legislation was based on what's reasonable for a fax machine. You know, if you're up a mountain, how quickly can you get that information to someone in a, in a town? And at that time, 24 hours was about reasonable. It was one working day. The, one of the other things that we've done, which is it's not apparatus related, but it's noticing related, is we've just passed a new legislation, the, the Transport Scotland Act 2019, that raises a power to amend the timescale that notices have to be updated in. Um, and th th we're looking at a two hour period. Um, th you know, the, the regulations and things have still to be set, but we're looking at around a two hour period. There was widespread support, roads authority and utility for that. You know, it, it benefits everyone to know faster. And just like Simon was saying, people have a, have a you know, they have an expectation now that information will be instantaneous. Um, so we, if we can get that time scale smaller, which is what we intend to do, then roadworks will be better planned. And, and especially for emergencies, the, the numbers aren't quite as high as Scotland for emergencies, they, they sit a bit lower and it's different by sector. But equally, the, I mean, emergency works, because of their nature as being unplanned, they are very disruptive. Um, you know, they, they, all the lovely planning that goes into all the planned works can just be thrown out the window overnight and it's, it's no one's fault, it's just what happens. Um, but if we can get that window smaller, then we can get the information out. And one of the other things that the commissioner provides uh, currently on a voluntary basis, but this is again something in legislation that will become 
specifically mandated for is that he, and I say he because the current post holder is Kevin Hamilton, um, you know, we, we've had lots of different commissioners and I tend to just say he because current one's a he. Um, he provides a website publicly which takes a subset of information from the register, so not the not the apparatus information, not the things which are specific or that you would want to keep within the community, that you wouldn't want more widespread awareness of, uh, you know, particularly in, in, for things like GDPR and, and, and people's details and, you know, any comments going back and forth. But the high level information is made publicly available on the Scottish Roadworks Commissioner's website. So where you live, you can look in, zoom in and see what works are planned for your area. Now, at the moment, that website is only accurate up to 24 hours because that's, that's the time scale that's written into legislation and that's when the notices are updated. Once we can get that smaller, that information can, can benefit not just us in, in the roadworks community and then streetworks community for, for, you know, across the UK, but, but the wider public and, and tying into exactly what Simon was, was covering earlier. Now, so my, my background is in IT or, 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 you know, so when it comes to the actual things like data models, uh, which we don't have, but, uh, you know, that type of thing, I, I can't really speak to that. It's really for the Commissioner's Office to speak to. But in terms of the, the legislation and the collaboration, we're a little bit further down the line. And we're, we've actually been working quite closely with Holger and his team to share that information because, you know, just like the data in the register, it is much better for everyone if that information is shared freely and we're supporting each other than keeping it siloed. Um, that's probably enough for me um, for now. That, that's quite a lot of Scotland in a short space of time. Uh, but I am happy to take any questions, if, you know, even on things like what is a commissioner or, or what does this acronym mean because it's slightly different for England and Wales. Yeah, well, we'll, we'll probably leave that for another day, Kat, but, but that's, that's helpful and kind of you to offer. Let's just try and keep the focus on digitalisation. Simon or Holger, was there anything you wanted to come back on what anybody else had said so far amongst colleagues? If not, I want to start uh, picking up any of the questions. Holger, go ahead. I've got a yeah, very, very short one. So the time to uh, or all three together is one thing is um, we've identified in the commission in, in our recent market research that there are spillover and further benefits from any register intervention that you can't really plan for. And that often is where the value is. So the sort of point about data in a register is fine, but people need to get access to it to do unforeseen things and have unforeseen benefits in the wider ecosystem is something that we're really aware of. So it's all about the externality. So there's a sharing beyond what the original scope for. So that was just one thing that came to my mind. No, but I think that's a great point. And Simon, you know, I think that's presumably, it sort of leans into the question that Mark Wrightson has asked at 9.52 is this issue about how is street manager change street direction of one network is the broader question. But, but I suppose the more, and I'll ask you if you want to touch on that. We appear to have uh, lost Clive. I, I assume he was just hand, handing me the, uh, yeah. the floor to uh, take on uh, that, that question uh, around street manager. And I think it's fair to say street manager, yeah, de definitely, does and has has had an impact in some of the strategic direction. I, I think it is quite an interesting thing because we're talking today about digitalization, which when you look at technology and innovation, it's generally seen as a uh, as a private sector led thing. Yeah, I, I'm sat on a panel here today as the only private sector organization, yeah, with two government organizations striding with forays into you know the digital and innovation space. Um, you know, and I, I think it is, is fair to say that Street Manager, uh, as you alluded to earlier, Clive, probably does not answer you know, all of the questions uh, that, that the street works um, uh, yeah, ha has to try and answer at the moment. You know, yes, it is bringing together a, a national register, but, but, you know, of permit data. And I think there is a much wider set of uh, information that informs the decision making process around um, you know, planning and what, what goes on with street works. And that's something we, we've always taken a specific view, um, you, know, you know, starting out with trying to build a national picture, you know, a good seven or eight years ago, but, but not solely relating to notices or permits, but also looking at all of those other events uh, that are going on, whether those be licenses, whether they be, you know, mass participation events like sporting events, all of those have a decision making, um, you know, element 
around where we, what we do with street works uh, and plan works. Uh, so we, we have continued our focus to ensure that we have yeah, a complete picture as to what is going on on the road at any one uh, point in time. But, but it has also caused us to think strategically about the direction we take with one network. Um, you know, it, street manager is there and it is you know, fulfilling a purpose around permits. So we, we've turned our eye to where, where can we add value to that process? And it, obviously, pre-permit, yeah, the pre-planning is one of those things. So bringing data in that, that is useful from a planning perspective, whether that be you know, taking data feeds from you know, a potential new R to bring you know, subsurface assets in, combining those with all the other assets that need thinking about um, you know, when planning some works is critical. And then I think during works, um, you know, what, what, what is actually going on and looking at developing or furthering some of our real-time tools. Um, you know, we, we, we were the leaders in bringing around the ability to communicate in real time about when works are happening. We've seen that quite well adopted within the highways authority sector, but not really from a, a utilities perspective. So we're, we're looking at ways that we can strengthen that and ensure that, yes, we've got a permit solution at a national level. But what happens before and what happens during and post works? Yeah. How, how can we make use of some of that technology around real time communication? How can we make use of real time traffic data, floating vehicle data? Um, you know, which is an incredibly rich resource that informs our decision making as to what impact we're likely to have around a piece of uh, work. So, you know, we're doing so it's some really interesting work at the moment around data analysis and understanding you know, impact of works to again allow better decision making up front around you know, sequencing and timing of works to, to try and yeah, help push that digital message but dovetail in with the street manager piece and provide that whole wraparound solution to what street managers providing as a permit system in the middle. Got it, Simon. Apologies, I think I just lost signal there just for uh, 30 seconds or so. Yep, no, I, I, I took your lead and uh, ran with it. Thank you. Thanks very much indeed. Good. No, I think I, you know, I caught up with everything you were, you were discussing there. Good. All right. Well, look, that's been a fairly fast and furious protein rich uh, 35 minutes or so. Um, you know, covering the, you know, the, the, the technical aspects to it. Holger, I just want to understand if you give us a quick, uh, a quick, you know, uh, 45 seconds or so on, on what, in, in, in terms of the technical challenges you faced in data um, understanding, what, what, what worry beads do you still have on the data technical side? In 45 seconds, the data audits we've done with the 45 um, stakeholders who participate in the two pilot areas were actually very positive. We have even um, got two um, local authorities who are able to stand up um, APIs and web services for their street furniture. We have generally everybody is in good shape. We have some vectorization still to do. So there are some utilities who have only got digital paper. We have a data model that everybody and symbology that everybody has agreed to. This is an all open geospatial consortium candidate model called MUDDY. So the challenges are potentially some extract, transfer um, and load processes which need resourcing. But overall on the technical level from the, from the client, from the asset owner side, a very positive, a very positive uh, picture really that we found. All right, well that's very encouraging. Okay, well that's very encouraging. Good. All right. Well, look, I want to come on now to uh, that aspect to do with mastering the technology and the behavioral aspects to it. And, and as we go into this piece now, I think what we want to be aware of is that it's, you know, if we go back to Simon's model of the six or seven components digitalization, we've talked quite a lot about the register. I think what we owe ourselves also is to talk about a bit more about the communication bit, you know, with the general public and those sorts of things and those at the aspect of emergency works that Kat's picked up and tra trace a slight difference between there. We'll leave the quality of data and some of those things to one side. But like I said, that has been a little bit protein rich. I just want to, I'm, I'm just, we're going to have a quick pause now because uh, we've still got quite a lot to get through here. Some really good questions on the on this stuff to get through. So let's have a quick break, grab a cup of coffee, and let's be back here at quarter past 10, okay? Uh, I'm just going to give you a quick five-minute break to grab a coffee and, uh, and leap back on board in a second, all right? Uh, see you in four and a half minutes. Thanks.
Um, but I can Okay, good. Welcome back, Holger. Simon, welcome back. Come back. And um, Kat, still to uh, rejoin us. Finishing off a couple of emails there, Kat, with the Scottish Government. <laughs> and um, good, all right. We've got about 30 seconds to go till I promise we come back from coffee break. I hope everyone's refreshed and good to go for the second part. Um, as we move into this second part, uh, looking at the behavioral stuff, one thing I think we'll kick off with, Tim, why don't you come on screen now? Tim over from Atkins. Tim, I'm not quite seeing you yet. Good morning. I'm, I'm here. Good morning, everyone. Morning, Clive. Come on screen. Turn your camera on, Tim. That'd be great. Here we go. Lovely, lovely job. Good. Tim, I, what I thought I'd do is turn the floor over to you and give us uh, actually something that syncs pretty well with our discussion here and, uh, and tell us what Atkins Global are up to, Atkins Utility Services are up to at the moment. So um, I think you've got a quick video to show. If you'd like to blast off into that first and turn it over to you, the key account manager for Atkins Utility Solutions. Go ahead. Sure, let's go ahead. So, Joe, if you just press play and uh... identifying underground utilities is an essential part of any design, planning or construction project. Considering what's underground allows you to make informed decisions during the feasibility and planning phase and helps you avoid utility strikes during the construction phase. But finding plans for underground assets is surprisingly difficult. This is why we offer our intelligent utility search reports. To get started, just draw your site boundary using the simple tools on our website. Once you've selected the services you would like, we will go ahead and obtain plans from all known utility owners in the area. This is important, and we know that many searches carried out by other providers are not always comprehensive. When complete, we will deliver information back to you in a report, allowing you to quickly see what utilities we have found. We can also deliver this digitally as a utility search map in geospatial formats, such as Shapefile, an AutoCAD DWG, or a KML file for Google Earth. Our maps include feature attribution. This means you can easily understand more information about the utility assets and quickly assess any risks that might be present. We know that managing utilities is a complex and time-consuming process. So we have a team of consultants that can help you plan the next steps. Utility strikes are dangerous and costly. Our searches are designed to improve safety, save time and reduce unnecessary spending. Utility solutions. Discover more. Okay. Uh, so, what a fantastic voiceover. You might recognize that voice, uh, everyone who's on the call. But um, let me just introduce myself. Um, my name is Tim Over. Um, similarly, um, I share quite a lot of things with a few of the panelists. So I have a geology background like Holger. Uh, I used to work in GPS sat-navs, uh, so similar to, to Simon. Uh, and I've also got a, a half a, a Scottish uh, family. So that links me with Kat quite nicely. Well, qualifies um, you entirely. <laughs> <laughs> so um, so th that's that's perfect. Um, I, I've been working with Atkins now for, for five years or so, into my sixth year actually next month. So um, uh, I, I'm very well placed uh, and know the sort of industry that um, we're currently dealing with. Um, and to talk about digitalization and where we are at the moment, I've got a few slides that I can share. Um, as well. So I'll just go ahead and, and share my screen if I may. Um, I've only got five minutes or so, so it won't be um, too taxing, I promise. Um, so if I just go ahead and just share my uh, share my screen just now, you'll see everybody else, but here we go. That looks good. There you go. So um, what, what Atkins are doing at the moment um, is to uh, provide uh, utility information um, in as best, best way, shape or form 
um, we can. And we deal with many of the large infrastructure projects in the UK. Um, we operate a search service that um, you know, grows across England, England, Wales, Scotland, Northern Ireland. Uh, what I want to talk about today is the current situation that Simon, Holger, Kat have, have spoken about, Clive introduced at, at the top. Um, utility data, there are some utilities that provide very useful data. Um, some utilities provide data in unusable formats or unfriendly formats, let's say. And uh, as Holger correctly uh, says, there's a huge demand to get this information um, in a usable manner, but also to have it in one central place. Um, we like to think we've, uh, we've got something. So if I just um, continue my, uh, my slides along, we have invested in, in innovation and, and digitalize it, or digitizing, I should say, um, some particular aspects of uh, receiving utility plans. Um, we've invested in technology, hopefully making it a simple process for users to actually access utility data. We've looked at in various formats um, where we can actually deliver uh, information, AutoCAD, Shapefile. Uh, I've mentioned Google Earth there um, recently where we've had to mobilize uh, and work remotely. You know, vast uh, desktop computers, not necessarily in place at everybody's homes. And, uh, you know, a laptop is, is capable of producing uh, some G GIS software uh, and running okay. But actually, if um, we're trying to show people where utilities are, actually our new KML slash, uh, slash street view uh, view of utilities has been especially useful in these uh, challenging times. And we also provide the PDF information. Um, it's important to rely on that information as a, as a source so you can see where that uh, all comes from. Finally, we've, uh, we've got a, an online search platform. Uh, and we've invested in something we call a disbursement engine that works out where you are in the country, what utilities are actually uh, located in that particular area, uh, and also how much they're gonna charge for some of their plans. We also have uh, an image georeferencing uh, automation service, and this all involves uh, obtaining utility information and putting in a geospatial format as quickly as possible. Um, and we've got a range of turnaround times, uh, and these all lead to savings um, that are in effect passed on to the client. In the future, well, we'll, we'll see quite a lot of change, I imagine. Um, considering where we were sort of 20 years ago starting up the service, um, it is a really fast paced industry. Um, we see the rise of technology and we want to be at the forefront of that. So we see 3D CAD deliverables, uh, especially where more utilities are actually providing more uh, attribution information, depths, for example. Uh, and we're really interested in the augmented reality space. Um, we're very aware of uh, uh, innovation in, in other technology streams that we're uh, very keen to support. We also have to abide by best practice. Um, PAS128, as many of you will know, um, is uh, best practice uh, specification for uh, making sure that users actually search the correct utilities uh, in the right area and obtain full comprehensive reports. Um, what we find in practice is uh, quite often some people may only request some plans from specific utilities and that leads to potential uh, hazards in the future uh, line strikes, um, damage, uh, etc., cetera, um, or even fatalities and injury. So we're very keen to avoid that. And from a safety point of view, that has to be at the forefront of everything that we provide. I'll just give you a bit of, uh, uh, a slide on accessibility as well. Clive, I know you mentioned that, um, uh, in your, in your briefing. Um, and really what good is data unless you've got a way to access it? Um, so having utility data from a desktop uh, office environment is one thing, but how can we actually improve on that? How can we get that information to mobile phones, to iPads, to laptops uh, on site? So fortunately, uh, we do have online deliverables, we have mobile deliverables, and we also have uh, some semi-automated uh, deliverables in terms of actually stripping out some of the data. And you'll see on the right-hand side there, we have a summary. Um, and what that is just a... Uh, uh, a bit of text really uh, to summarize the utility uh, constraints, let's say, or, or acknowledgement of what utilities are actually acting on a particular site uh, and provide you some language. Because what we find sometimes is that uh, map reading skills are limited. 
and to actually give people uh, some clear information as to what actually is on a particular site is very, very uh, important. Uh, and finally, just on the, uh, the iPhone shot you've got there, uh, we've been looking at Street View and how we can incorporate, incorporate our utility plans onto that. But also the uh, function that you know, Google Earth already has where it can pinpoint your location uh, using your phone's GPS, um, finding yourself on a, uh, on a map can be quite challenging. So we're keen to try and remove hurdles to make it easy as possible. And we've got a couple of case studies. Um, Clive, I know I'm just uh, approaching the uh, end of my slot here, but various uh, wind farms we deal with, we can actually uh, provide searches for cable routes, provide a digital map. Um, that then helps with uh, looking at route optioneering. Uh, we can provide new connections and that gets onto the next steps of any particular uh, project. Um, so. I will just uh, leave my next slide, which is a QR code that will link to our website, but I've got my email address there if anybody wants to ask any questions. Uh, back to you, Clive. Well, that's superb, Tim. Thanks very much and syncs very well in terms of rounding off that, uh, uh, should we say our technical understanding of what the opportunities are. Let's go ahead and cancel screen sharing there if you can, oh, well, Tim, that'd yeah. be great. Thank you. And you um, we'll get back in uh, not yet canceled screen sharing. There we go. There okay, go. good. All right. Well, that's really helpful. Uh, Simon, there may be some thoughts in there for you that you want to come back to later on and, and, and touch on uh, uh, a critique of Atkins utility. But what a, what a comprehensive offering, Tim. That sounds really good. All right. Look, I said, I promise now in this final 35 minutes, we're right on a timeline. We come back to discuss the behavioral side of things. And specifically, I think it's this aspect to do with those six or seven things we talked about that Simon put on the table. And it comes into mastering the technology. Uh, and some of that is contained in what Tim just discussed, of course. Um, .kml is a new one on me, I have to confess. I'm going to uh, blather that around everywhere I go from here on in. But a lot of this is about the behavioral side of how do we deliver the works efficiently? How do we do it effectively? How do we in, you know, increase the speed of traffic where it's needed to and reduce that congestion uh, and actually reduce the admin burden on the utilities, the contractors, and indeed the local authorities? I think there's something here which Cole, Holger talked about, which was using the transparency you know, is, is actually an extension of open government, um, you know, and, and the open society of data and information we have here. What, what I do think behaviorally, it's about seizing the opportunity and thinking about how we train people for this digital aspect and then communicate in a totally digital way. So many of you will hear me talk about how, you know, it's, it's not really, uh, the people of today aren't picking their information up from newspapers, radio, stuff like that. It's all from their handheld. If you're aged between 25 and 35, you pick your information up from a very different source. And this demographic of people, of course, is moving through, uh, you know, life and, and uh, you know, in due course, that would have changed the way that we pick up our information. And Tim actually talked in, in, in part about that. I'm going to quick tell you a very, very quick story, you know, training accreditation, for example. We just had a meeting on training accreditation the other day to find that, you know, some people will not do the training accreditation modules for street works um, on a computer-based system. They will only go and do it in paper and sort of overcoming some of that inertia on, on where they think they're going to get their valued learning is from a paper-based approach because it can be guaranteed, whereas they're worried in terms of doing it on an online platform, which may, uh, as happened a couple of seconds ago to me, you know, uh, break your contact for 30 seconds or so. But um, let me uh, pause there and turn it over to the panel now. Uh, Holger, uh, this is not an area for you to major on the behavioral side of things. Arguably, we have been discussing separately that. But, but in terms of how you translate this NUR program into something that really, you know, goes out and flows out, what, what are the sort of precepts you put on the ground in terms of, 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 of getting through to people on this? Can you share that with us? Yeah, gr great. So um, f breaking down... Um, uh, we've had a couple of, so I've made a couple of notes here from picking up from, from earlier. Um, um, public sector, private sector boundaries um, um, and working across them. Um, and how we've done this is um, to not have, like Kat mentioned also, like some sort of top-down Westminster driven um, approach, but working with the communities. And we really mean that and did that by um, in the Northeast and in London we had local authority led um, private sector led we have worked with with streetworks uk with the hawks with geo place 
and really, yeah, constant local engagement and listening and feeding back. And we are planning in the regional national rollout to maintain a very hands-on um, local engagement with with the people um, um, using using the system. And absolutely, just wanted to reiterate that point. I think the breaking down of the the, the old perception that here's the public sector and here's the private sector and we do things differently. Really, in newer, what I sort of mentioned earlier, the the sharing a common have sharing the common problem, the, the common use case, and 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 the data, the digitalization in public and private sector, leading to a common data model, and therefore being able to put things onto one map, is really working for us that people can see themselves in the same space. Um, very quick one on your point about offline working. It's absolutely a requirement going forward that if connection does drop out people on the roads and streets are still able to work so we are building and we're looking to the dutch um, example how you can take things offline is absolutely vital so yeah good good point there okay i'm uh, simon i'm going to come to you last if i may and go go really to um, through 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 cats experiences and, and observations on 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 you know what that might mean and, and what that in fact that might have cat over to you <coughs> Sorry, <coughs> there we go. Um, yeah, so one of the things actually I was, I was going to mention is, um, and, and Simon kind of picked on this again about the register. And I keep talking about the register because really for Scotland, although we're talking about digitization globally, and actually, a uh, small plug, the Scottish Government are currently consulting on our digital strategy which is available on the website. So if anybody wants to have a view into that, and that's, that's broadly across all data, you know, that's there. Um, I would have circulated the link if I'd thought to bring it with me. But, um, you know, we, the reason we talk about the register and the, the public facing website, which feeds from that, is because the benefit in Scotland is really to having everything in one place. So as well as the sort of noticing side and that, you know, actual requesting of, of, of road space, the register, has been developed incrementally over time it didn't drop out of the sky in its current format it's been slowly shaped by the community some of the things that that people that use the register already have access to are things like uh, parades um, street fairs uh, christmas embargoes road races all of that information about things which are on roads that are not necessarily roadworks is, is there and the reason why it's there is is not you know it's no benefit it's locked in a local authority filing cabinet and only the local authority knows about it the people that really need to know about it are the people that are planning works so you know it, rather than having a system whereby can i work this week no can i work this week no can i work this week no all the information is there and open so that if you are planning works, you can see, well, there is a, you know, there's a Christmas fair on that day and there's something else on the next day. And, and that information's there and, and that's shared. Uh, and that is also part of the information that, you know, because, you, you know, we do have the open uh, data commitment and all those things that has to be shared. So, you know, all of that information is there and it's usable. Um, and, and some of the things that the Commissioner's Office done to make that more usable for the community is uh, they put forward a range of apps um, so generally for the use of the system there's an inspection app but really the two main ones in, in the sort of digitization arena are the the starts and stops app and I don't actually know if that's what it's called um, I'll need to ask them what it's actually called but it's the one where you can start and stop works from site um, and that's actually it's been developed because we knew that legislatively we were going to go to a shorter period but also it's just convenient that rather than having to do a sort of archaic process of phoning a back office for someone to press a button why not just bring the button to site um, and then the other one is the Vault app, which has it's got a huge benefit. You know, it's, it's mobile, it's available on tablet. If you're out, it works in the middle of the night, it's better than nothing. It's better than, than having no plans at all. Uh, I mean, I'm, I'm old enough that, I, you know, my experience on site is holding sort of 13 pieces of soggy paper and trying to match things up and actually having everything on one device is, is much easier. But you're right. I mean, we've got this cultural issue with, with, Sort of road workers generally that paper is how it's always been and paper is what i want and paper is what i know um you know something that's it's perhaps going more into training is the fact that you know the training we have doesn't focus a lot on here is how you interpret these 13 pieces of paper you know it's expected you know like like Holger was saying about map reading skills i think it's Holger. um the people that work on site will generally pass information on through peer learning this is a water plan this is how it looks this is a 
a BT plan, this is how it looks. If you actually want to look for some place where all of that information is captured, you know, there is nothing nationally at the moment that does that. A lot of it is in-house. Um, and once we move to things being available and online, and, you know, I, I did say we don't have a data model, that, that really means that yeah, information can come into the, the commissioner's supplier in any format and then be put together in a way that, that's consistent. So it's not that when you look on the map, everything's in 15 different types of symbology. Um, it's just that the people submitting it don't have to do that pre-work at the moment. But once we have that, that cultural shift away from I can only do it by paper will be natural. And, and I mean, just anecdotally, one of the things that I've said is um, a lot of the people that say they can't work off tablets will be quite happily playing Candy Crush in their breaks. So, you know, it's not that we're dealing with people from the 1900s that have never seen a computer. It's, it's something that actually is within our grasp to do. Um, and I'll just I'll very quickly just throw out one real world example because it's just come to me. It's actually quite a good uh, use case example. It's not strike or pre-planning or any of the other things that we think. Over the period of COVID, as you'll be aware, we went to an almost near shutdown in Scotland of construction and roadworks. And what we were able to do was take some work that SGN had done. So SGN had done some really good work contacting material suppliers, seeing who was open, seeing what they were providing and sharing that. Because the basis of the Scottish Roadworks community is that we share information to each other's benefit. So SGN did not sit on that supplier information just for their own needs. It was shared openly with the, with the community. What that allowed us to do from a resilience perspective and a, a Scottish government resilience perspective was match that to the open data from the register of where works were. Now we had to make a number of assumptions because there were probably some sites that were in the register live but actually had been, you know, it, it was a time when there was a lot of things shut down at short notice. So I wouldn't say it was 100% accurate, but we were able to map graphically on a, on a map of Scotland, here is supply, here is demand, and that allowed us to identify our not spots. Um, and it was actually really useful work. It allowed us to intervene rather than sort of mail shot in every quarry in Scotland. It allowed us to really target our approach um, and just having that information there and available and on a basis that it's already being shared allowed us to do that work, which was really something that was key to getting through that sort of main lockdown period. Um, and that's not that's not a use case that I would have ever predicted for that information, but having it there and having it in one place meant that we could do that and, and do that at short notice. Uh, that's really interesting. Thank you for that. And now you've 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 laid out a couple of interesting things there. Um, you know, one of which is I think is vital is this aspect about uh, being shaped by the community, and um, in a certain sense, that's what I meant by the sort of open government to open data to an open system. And uh, and I'd be very interested to hear what Simon thinks about that that open style. On the app side of things, of course, as you know, we've been working on developing a Hawk app. Um, uh, you know, for people to use, and it's turned out to be actually really good in terms of what that will offer people, and is a first sort of step in. In, uh, but we need to see what sort of penetration into the workforce that that usage of that gets, and we'll know more about that in a further six months. I think the other thing we shouldn't lose sight of when you touch on some of those things is this aspect to do with. Um, uh, you know, when you've got mar large PLC companies with their company work systems, you can't, you've got to develop systems that, that work, you know, e API wise with their work systems uh, in many cases and, the, and you won't have standalone. So it's the transferability of data and the digitalization of data that, that becomes absolutely critical. But um, Simon, let me turn it over to you now, really, in terms of focusing on this behavioral stuff. And are there any particular threads here? I mean, obviously, the utility of your platform you can speak to but um, uh, and, and please do but we're talking about more the general uh, sense of, of, of concepts of, of behavior here rather than perhaps just the detail of, of, of how you solutionize things but but please free reign. No, I, I, absolutely thanks for that Clive and yeah I, I alluded to it a little bit earlier but but I think yeah organizational change is one of the critical aspects here you know it's all good and well to uh, develop, build, buy a software solution. You know, you know th those things exist out there and anybody can go out and buy a solution tomorrow. Um, the reality is though, that that doesn't solve any challenges. It's just a new piece of software, a new database, a new data schema. It is the embedding of that in the, in the organizational process that is what realizes the benefit of having that software or that 
um, data um, uh, available to people. Yeah, and I think it's it's really interesting, you know, because I, I, I have called out that I think this industry is quite slow to change or has been slow to change. I think actually COVID has been a really interesting um, example to see how we can adapt and how we can change quickly uh, as an industry. You know, we, we've seen immediately, you know, some of our highway authority customers, you know, just by having digital tools available, running their traffic management control centers from home. Yeah, in a completely disaggregated way when everybody is so used to being tied to a traffic control center within a county hall to suddenly having 20 staff at home. Yeah, I've seen all of our customers yeah, adopt a Zoom teams yeah, and be willing to open conversations and meetings in doing that. We've seen um, you know, great collaboration between JAG, Hawk, you know, all, all of London coming together um, to start yeah, looking at all the road changes that are happening for COVID that have an impact on both the road user, but actually on the street works industry and the works promoters that want to get out there. If the roads change, you need to know that. And we've suddenly seen, you know, over the space of two months, 31 out of the 33 London boroughs beginning to plot that information on our platform to share that with the industry. Um, you know, so it shows that we can change. Yeah. And we've also got other big programs like this whole, um, you know, fibre rollout at the moment that again, we're seeing, um, you know, with the likes of OpenReach working with Sheffield, looking at this um, whole flexi permit opportunity. Yeah, it's been great uh, to be part of that and to sit in meetings and see openness and collaboration between those organisations. You know, looking at what is quite a challenging and different change, but met with such positivity and openness to trying to move the industry forwards. And it strikes me that we are kind of in a perfect storm at the moment with all of these things happening to really latch onto those and to drive um, yeah, the, that behavioural change. And I think that the question for me is, how do we create that incentive within the industry as a whole to not just rely on these specific instances like COVID to suddenly make change happen, but how do we drive this change you know, or, on a regular basis how do we push the whole industry forwards and I, I think one of the questions um, that, that I have is around what, what is the role of government whether that's central government and the legislation it produces what is the role of the regulators what is the role of the private sector in coming together to move things forwards uh, yeah and I think Holger you make a, a, a really interesting point there around the, the new R project and the desire for public private partnership. I think a question or challenge I have to you is, is new R going to be available to companies like us? Yeah, we, we've got a rich user base of one network, you know, where, where we're, we're getting over 25 million public inquiries on the website. Yeah, each year we've got over 40,000 registered users on the platform, all of whom are streetworks professionals in some shape or form that are crying out for that data. Um, so I, I'm really intrigued to know whether, you know, new R will be something that is available to organizations like us that we can then use to communicate that information to that wide audience, which would be a perfect yeah, example of that public, um, you know, pu public private relationship. And for me, that kind of lies at the heart of how we engender um, and drive through change, you know, and there, there was lots of interesting conversation yesterday um, in that collaboration session, uh, Clive, around how do we create incentive and you know, still lots of you know, umming and ahhing around liabilities and who, who actually takes liability and sharing. I think we need to try and remove that mindset, but actually that is where it comes back to my point of what is the role of legislation, of regulators, of, um, you know, the, the local authorities, of the private sector to all How come together in the right way and drive that on. Sorry, Holger. That's all right. It's all right. Olga, why don't you go ahead and pick that question up, uh, speaking as a, uh, a government servant, but let's keep the yeah. comments to two minutes. I'll, I'll be quick, it's especially as this, some of it is a work in progress. So first um, direct answer is that NUR is conceived initially as is vault for the statutory undertakers and their um, supply chain. Um, we do have the end game is absolutely for as many other actors to have access to innovate and to uh, increase the, the 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 reach and the usability um, is the absolute end is, is the end game is the end vision. However, important here is that 
we don't, central government doesn't own any of the data. The data is owned by the asset owners, the, the operators, the network operators, the highways authorities, the local authorities. So everything needs to be done in consent and in agreement with the commercial, legal um, and security teams, which is what, why it's so important that we take a step-by-step -step approach. However, um, we are seeing, so the incentivization, what is the incentivization? Well, it's useful. That it is useful to share. People are seeing the benefit. In our interviews throughout the pilots, you know, savings of hours, reducing pain, increasing efficiency and safety. Everybody is incentivized by having a useful tool. And just a, a quick one to, to finish here um, is is um, is yeah is the is the collaboration between the different actors um, is absolute key. And I think the the era we're entering, and I had a, a talk the other day from someone from the private sector, I can't remember which, many of the many, many webinars we're all on. Um, it's it's the, 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 the age of the dinosaur age of hanging on to data and controlling your own data silo uh, is, is over. And one quick point I'll just make to, the, to my co-panelists here. We are getting to a stage where we are trusting each other with our data even if the data is not completely perfect so no data especially in the subsurface where you can't see everything is going to ever be completely perfect so what we are building also is trust between all the different actors to share data with the caveats and you mentioned the liabilities and all of that to share data before you think it's perfect and improve, right? Have feedback mechanisms and improve data as, as you work on, on, on the streets and roads. Okay, Holger, thank you for that. You've, you kind of picked up the point from Tor in the, uh, in the to, to his 1042 point. Um, um, and, and Kat, what I thought I might do is come back to you and see if you have a view on that, that uh, public sector, you know, ownership of the data, but also possibly pick up at the same time Tim Over's point about any evidence of Scottish fault. And if you see the 1040 question and mm -hmm. deal with, would deal with both of those. I don't want to just get too, too into the technical side of things, mm -hmm. but they, they do deserve attention as, as, as thoughts. Oh no, I mean, absolutely. They, they, so unfortunately the law, and it's actually the law in both uh, UK and, and, and wide and Scotland, is is quite quiet on the subject of utility strikes. It's actually somewhere where our, our friends in the Netherlands and Belgium are much further ahead because they mandate that strikes must be reported. Um, so we don't have anything like that here. So it's quite difficult to capture that information. If you ask the insurance departments of all utilities and roads authorities, they will have a complete list of every pipe and cable that's ever been struck. There's no central register of that just now, so it's quite difficult to track actual strikes. And that's not to say it's not something we'll look at in the future, but you know, incremental development, we'll, we'll, we'll get there eventually. What we do look at is things like use. So, you know, it's just, it's the same as in, in retail. People will not use something if it's difficult to use and if it's of no benefit to them. And so the fact that Vault is used increasingly and with every iteration, we take as a basis that it's having a benefit. Now, some utility firms have actually confirmed to us, uh, so not so much on strikes, but on admin time, that what was previously a job that would take 25 minutes can now be done in, I think, three, might be seven, but it's, it's a much shorter period. And so the benefit to the company in, in admin savings is, is enormous. There's other assumptions that we make on things like strikes because uh, I think, uh, if, I, if I remember correctly, there's about two and a half thousand accesses a month to the vault system, which for a country the size of Scotland and, and the, the number of works we do is it means that, that you know that's quite a good coverage. That's that's a good figure. Um, but it's increasing. I mean obviously roadworks are cyclical, so annually you'll have low spots and high spots, but it, it's something that uses and continues to be used, which which we use for that basis. But I would love to have more direct information. Um, you know, and that's assuming that all strikes are reported, which is as you know in practice, you know, depending on what you hit and when you hit it, it, it might be that there's a culture of just burying it again and not mentioning it um, so you know it's all things that are, are definitely things that we're aware of and we want to gather better data on and it's actually something that uh, you know I was talking to Holger's team about because that's something they're looking at as well is how do you quantify that and it, it is quite difficult um, in terms of the sort of public and private sector you're, I mean you're right the, the information which is currently shared to vault and I mean we're obviously unique in Scotland in that we have public utility still um, well one public utility but it's there um, is that the information comes in and it's recombined and it's put into the system and it's for everyone's benefit. The idea that, that Holger raised about imperfect data, 
the way that we see it and the way that we operate is that we all have a piece of the jigsaw puzzle um, and it's you see more of the overall picture if you all put them in and connect it up even if you've got pieces missing here and there you've got a far better chance of seeing the overall picture if you all share and if you all hang on to your own individual jigsaw piece and that's the basis on how the whole i mean not just the vault section but the entire register and the entire community and all the codes of practice and advice notes that's the basis on which they've been developed in that we all want the same things from each other we all hold the same information that everyone else wants it's far better and there's far better use if that's shared than if it's siloed and that's something that we realized really early on and that's underpinned everything that we've done i would say in the last 15 years um, Simon, I want to bring you on here. You know, the challenges of imperfect data, Elgin have struggled with this probably over a period of time. And, um, you know, I, I imagine there's fairly, some fairly technical wizardry ways of dealing with things that are the standard deviation to what expectation is. But nonetheless, it must be the bugbear that you deal with on a, on a daily basis, is it? Um, I it is something that we 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 deal with i, I think the the greatest way uh, and this kind of just emphasizes what holger the point holger made uh, really the greatest way to improve the quality of data is to shine a light on it you know we, we faced exactly that problem that you know producing an, a national data set of notices and making that available to the whole industry yes the data was imperfect to begin with what it immediately does is gets everybody's eyes on it and people then recognize where there are weaknesses and challenges and then discuss where that data is inaccurate. And you suddenly see this self-serving industry actually take its own steps forwards to improve the quality of that data. So, so yes, you're absolutely right. There's stacks that we've got in our armory as a technology business. Yeah, we're, we're seeing us have, having to employ that you know, in America at the moment where people's permits are not even geo-referenced and we're having to reverse geocode data to try and get it in in some semblance of useful level of accuracy for people. You know, similarly, we see people granting blanket four-month permits over there. You know, so there's all sorts of challenges, as I alluded to, is 10 years ago, um, UK and the US. Um, yeah, but we, we have seen a dramatic improvement in the quality of data you know, around road permits um, yeah, over the last 10 years that we, we've been in existence, purely by getting that data together in a single place, making it available to lots and lots of people, making it publicly available. And that helps the industry make its own strides uh, in improving. And I think that that is exactly the same for um, subsurface assets. Absolutely, that data won't be perfectly accurate. Yes, there are some great technologies out there to help improve that, but let's not that let that get in the way of doing something with it let's get it all together put it somewhere and then we can figure out where the weaknesses are as an industry and move it forwards uh, and that really is yeah i think what we have to do um yeah uh, we we've absolutely seen that in the gathering of our data yeah o over many years yeah we, we it isn't so much of an issue for us anymore simply because the industry has figured out it needs to be done well and accurately okay good um Perhaps I could just, because uh, uh, I will come on, I want to talk a little bit about some of the survey work we have done um, to find out some of the accuracy of that data and, uh, should we say, different perceptions between contractors and utilities of that. But Kat, if we're talking about, if we just focus for a second on this sort of communication uh, aspect with the, with the road users community, and then I'll revert, come back to Simon finally to shine, a, 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 perhaps illuminate, you know, the far horizon of what you might conceptually have in mind as an as a exemplar company of doing that. What, what do you think the general public and, and, and your, um, you know, the elected uh, representatives, what are, they, what are they trying to deliver for the general public in this area, Kat, from a, from a Scottish government perspective? Well, we we actually just recently published our programme for government for the year, which is, I mean, it has lots of very high overarching themes, which, you know, obviously, you, you know, you, you can't be too specific with those types of things. But uh, one of the things is the, now it, it seems strange, it seems like strange bedfellows, but actually there's a climate change um, connection here, because not only do you have things like, um, you know like greener spaces and, and having you know better planned works tend to be done better they tend to be better quality so you have fewer return visits um having the information centrally you can do sort of lots of you know pre-planning and making sure that things are 
or there's intervention before things actually fail. But even things like, um, so infrastructure resilience. So if you look at things like the increase of things like flash floods and lightning strikes, having a register of all of these things that are affected by that allows your platform to then build in resilience for the future. Uh, now, at a much more local level, we have things like the Commissioner's website, which puts information out into the public domain, so people can do so. You know, it actually specifically says, do not use it for journey planning, but so people can, can use that information for their own lives, um, I'll put it that way. Um, but that commitment to having that data open and, and shared, uh, but also respecting the sort of commercial aspect of it, in that not every part of that data is in the public interest, you know, they don't need to know how much the pipes cost or, you know, the name of the charge handles, that's information that's not in the public interest. So having that there really ties into those kind of overarching themes. Um, and obviously we have our, our commissioner who is an independent body and, and does set his own best practice and his own views, um, but it's very much aligned to that programme for government. Um, so we've, we've, you know, commitment to sort of greener spaces and better communities and safer communities. And I know we've not really touched on, you know, I know you, you spoke Clive about the training and accreditation group, but even things like within the register that we have at the moment, one of the pieces of data that it captures is a, a qualification inspection. So if, if you are a, a person who's working on site, you can be asked where is your streetworks card and and that's not done offline or in a spreadsheet or through a separate process it's all done openly um, now that's the type of information that probably wouldn't be shared because there's the gdpr aspect to it but having that there all contributes to a, a greener and safer community and a better environment um and, and also allows us to do that sort of future infrastructure planning i know that was quite a fairly broad statement um but, but that is kind of where, where we see those things going Okay, no, thank you for that. Tim, I wanted you to come back on the camera and just give you give us a quick sense actually from, from where from where you sit in terms of you know you're going you're out and about and, and understanding what the what what the public want as much as what the companies want. What 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 occurs to Atkins in terms of what what the opportunity is here for for, for making things more more visible and communicating with the public? Are, are there some real precepts you're rolling out to your customer go, you know, you really want to get with this program in this area here? Uh, well, if I can touch on one point in terms of timing, um, of course, your client wants things done yesterday, whereas your utility company wants 10 days to respond. So naturally, there's a, a line in the sand there where you have to uh, pick, a, pick a service that is timely, but also gives a utility a chance to respond to, to an inquiry. Um, Fortunately, the, the landscape at the moment is that uh, as an industry, we are getting quicker at responding. Um, so through various means, um, it can be uh, an, a matter of hours for a response rather than a matter of weeks. Um, so that's, that's one point. In terms of uh, your, your sort of follow-up um, to, uh, as, a, as a community, where are we in terms of going forward and, and um, overcoming challenges um, we, we have a we have a service there are a number of um, uh, suppliers and different routes to get information um, at the moment you know it's like quite a lot of things um, if it doesn't work it, for you it might work for for other people and the system that we have at the moment um, might work for many different utility companies and uh, that's sort of a good starting point um, but to reinvent the wheel, maybe it's not necessarily uh, okay. Okay. a thing, you know? Um, All right. No, understood. Got that. Simon, lastly, would you just like to give us a sort of a paint a quick picture of the far horizon that, uh, that you folks are working with at the moment in the final, in the final couple of minutes? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. And it's, it's not, that much of a far horizon you know I, I think technology has moved in such a way that what we might have perceived as um you know the heineken style utopian view it is wholly possible you know re really what you want to be looking at is how do we get the world you know the best pre-planning yeah have we got all of the right data in a single system accessible to people not only from the office but at home on site well 
largely that is available for people today. I think the next step from that is to then look at what the impact and the potential disruption of works is as part of the planning process. And there, there is absolutely still work to be done in that space. We're working with partners you know, within the uh, sat-nav sector, looking at floating vehicle data and using um, uh, data analytics and traffic modeling on that so that people can look at the impact of works and factor that into their, their planning process. I then think you have um, what, what is happening in a, uh, you know, on site, you know, being able to communicate in real time, you know, so it not solely being the responsibility of the utility or even their contractor, but putting technology in the hands of the traffic management contractor. Yeah, and we're, we're seeing technologies out there and we're working with a couple of companies now with smart cones or smart signs. You know, so that rather than there being a permit that starts and stops at eight in the morning and six p.m., that actually the second the first cone goes out, that signal comes through to us, and we transmit that out to sat navs and back to the highways authority at the Brilliant. same time to say the work has start, yeah, started, and now the work has stopped, and that being an immediate flow, that technology pretty much exists, and we're now just embarking on a project with a, a highways authority, um, you know, to to get that workflow uh, moving um, you know and then I think looking at real-time tracking and monitoring as to what is going on to while the work is happening what impact is it having yes we expected it to have this impact but what impact is it actually having is it any different and can we do something about that that would then improve the traveling public and I think all of those things are absolutely in our immediate horizon our, our quite near-term horizon and some slightly you know a couple of year, year or two away horizon but I think if we put all of those facets together we've got the technology the tools and the capability to go and realize that utopian view we can understand everything that's going on ensure that we can coordinate we can share trenches if that yeah be be useful we can ensure that we're reducing the cost of failure um yeah not having overruns and overstays that everybody has got that clear and tra transparent communication and that for me is a win-win for everybody you know it saves the utilities, the promoters, um, you know, time and money. You know, it improves the communication and the lives to the, the highways authority and ultimately it improves, um, you know, things for the traveling public, you know, to have awareness as to what is happening, you know, okay. how their journeys Good. are going to be disrupted. So it, it's not that far away. Um, okay. What it is going to need is that right acceptance of change uh, and ability to consider how we do things as an industry to adopt and make best use of yeah exactly the, those tools and technologies that are out there today wow simon you'll be you're painting a fascinating picture there and indeed you know we aren't going to have quite so many people stealing cones once they've got little uh, gps trackers in them now are we in terms of their driveway uh, protection look there's one thing i want to leave you with because this behavioral aspect is absolutely fascinating and we do actually have a uh, a very international webinar coming up um joel would you just play the video for us now because this speaks exactly to some of the um um uh, Go ahead. We know that over 4 million streetworks excavations are conducted in the UK each year. Each of these run the risk of damaging a vast and growing network of our underground services. And striking these underground services is a high safety risk for both workers and for the public. Each year, lives are lost due to lack of or inconsistent safety precautions. And the implications on society for lost services is also severe. To investigate the state of the UK industry, a team of three leading UK trade organisations teamed up with Geomatic. The organisations each asked their members what behaviours are actually exhibited during excavation. And the results uncovered a number of unsafe or inefficient practices. We'd also flagged widely different views from contractors and asset owners on key issues. And these findings are presented and discussed during our launch webinar on the 9th of December. We see you there. Okay, thanks, Joel. Good. Well, look, let's uh, time to time to close now. We've had a, uh, a rich tapestry there from everyone in terms of starting to get our head around what is a mammoth subject 
across across a range of six or seven different and interesting areas. Um, good that quite so many of you actually stayed on the call and, and uh, allocated the time to what is a, a key part of our vision for Streetworks and Roadworks UK. Uh, but let me just say thank you uh, very much to Holger, uh, for giving the NUAR perspective, um, to Simon uh, for clearly stating how Elgin is facing up to those challenges, and Kat giving us, should we say, a converse view in terms of the lessons that have already been learned and sometimes uh, learnt in micro ahead of us in, uh, in, in England by, by Scotland. So thank you for sparing the time and giving us such clear thoughts and thinking in that area. Lastly, Tim, uh, what a great sync with your work in terms of Atkins Solutions. Thank you for that. Um, it merely remains for me to say uh, we'll, we'll close the session now. Um, we'll, we'll reconvene at two o'clock um, this afternoon uh, and look forward to seeing you there. Uh, an absolutely vital piece at two o'clock this afternoon, tracing the policy landscape changes that we expect. Look forward to seeing you then. Thanks very much indeed and good morning. Cheerio for now. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thank you, Clive. Thanks, folks. Thanks, Thank Clive. you.